Uh, my name is Stepan and I'm a paranoic. Uh, and what I mean is I feel really uncomfortable when I need to put my private keys on the online machine, especially to, if it is a general purpose hardware uh, like a normal computer. Uh, so some time ago I started looking into the Lightning implementations and how could we possibly move our private keys away from existing Lightning nodes to something uh, more secure, maybe a hardware wallet or an air gap machine or, well, basically somehow to improve the security of the node. Uh, and this is basically what I want to talk about. And yeah, the subtitle of the talk is actually a comment coming from the C Lightning source code, in particular HSMD daemon uh, that uh, handles all your secrets. Yeah. Uh, so um, first, let's uh, talk about what Lightning is, uh, what security you know, threats are there in Lightning comparing to the normal Bitcoin transactions. So just like in Bitcoin, not your keys, not your Bitcoins. So we need to keep our private keys as safe as possible. Uh, also, we don't trust, we verify. We need to verify everything that we are signing, either we by ourselves or maybe our uh, hardware wallet. Uh, and uh, the additional thing that we have in Lightning is that we need to react quickly. So we have time of contracts everywhere in the channels in the HDLCs uh, so if we don't react uh, in time then we can also lose the funds uh, and so if we put on the scale where we are now we are completely reckless we store all our private keys on the machines uh, on the computers that are connected to the internet and broadcasting to the whole world that this is my IP address and I am willing to route the payments I have some money here uh, and uh, yeah there are a few steps that we need to take one by one how to get from this reckless scenario to a more boring and uh, reasonably safe use case uh, so mm, yeah basically there are multiple steps uh, the first one that we will be deployed probably pretty soon as the watchtower that already improves uh, the security a bit because uh, we, at least if we are not offline uh, we are not online then um, we are still we still have some security guarantees uh, but uh, then there are others uh, how can we actually move the secrets to the hardware wallet uh, before going there let's quickly recap uh, the lightning tech roughly what kind of keys we have there uh, so first, the most obvious one uh, is the key that we will use to actually open the channel, right? So it can be from our normal Bitcoin wallet, uh, well, SegWit, that's the only uh, restriction. Uh, and it is basically just uh, sending the money to our two of two multi-signature uh, address where our key, one key is ours and another one is from the remote node. Uh, then we have this um, funding uh, private keys that we will use all the time. So these are basically the most important ones because they sign all our double spends that we do afterwards uh, and then we have the channel updates uh, the commitment transactions uh, that are basically a double spends and here we have uh, also different keys uh, so we have the keys that um, control the addresses where we will get the funds if we want to close the channel unilaterally so you know we can close the channel two ways good way and the ugly way uh, well and the bad way uh, so the good way is uh, by uh, mutually closing the channel and the bad way is by broadcasting one of the commitment transactions so there are keys that will store our bitcoins if the one of the states is broadcasted and also we have another uh, secret that is a revocation uh, secret uh, that we use to make sure that uh, not neither we nor other party uh, doesn't publish the old state. So whenever we update the channel state, we update the channel balances, uh, we give the other party this secret such that if we broadcast the old state, he can punish us and get all the money. Uh, and yeah, the finally, uh, in a um, good way, we can talk to the other node when we are done, when we're done uh, like uh, 20 million transactions. Uh, we talk to him and say, okay, let's now close the channel, we are done, uh, and so let's uh, move the funds to your address and uh, our address. So basically here what we have, the very first key and the very last key can be from our normal uh, Bitcoin wallet. Uh, and all other keys are normally derived from the, uh, well, basically channel specific. So different channels have slightly different uh, secrets there. And uh, so uh, 
There are also a few other keys, uh, other secrets, for example, the node ID that doesn't control any funds at all. The only thing that the node ID does, it signs the invoices uh, and it also can communicate to other nodes. Uh, basically, it's our uh, representation in the network, but it doesn't control any funds. So I'm not putting it here even. Um, so uh, now looking at all these keys, um, we don't use all of them very often. So some of them we can move to the air gap machine, for example, to the cold storage. So what of this key, which of these keys we can actually move to the cold storage? Uh, so first, the, our normal Bitcoin keys can be moved to the cold storage because we use them only, well, basically we use the first one only once when we open the channel and then we are done. So for this we can uh, go to the air gap sign and blah blah blah. Uh, then uh, other keys that we don't normally use are the ones that will control the funds in uh, the commitment transaction, so these blue ones. Uh, we never sign with them really. So uh, they will have some funds only if uh, we unilaterally close the channel. So they can also be kept offline. So we don't really need to access to them all the time. Uh, so the most important ones that always need to be online are the funding keys that are basically signing our channel updates all the time. Uh, and also uh, the revocation keys that we need to give to other party on every channel update. Uh, so uh, what happens if we move all these keys to the air gap? And it is in the protocol, it is built in in the bold specification uh, that these particular keys can go to the cold storage. So how it helps us? Um, do you know how the attackers, the, like hackers, work normally? They're not very, uh, well, they're smart, but they're not focusing on Bitcoin normally. Well, at least kind of uh, hackers that hack the servers. So what they do, they just do their job, they get into the computer, and then they sweep all the Bitcoin that they see just using the scripts. Basically, uh, all, if you think of their behavior in the Bitcoin space, they are just script kiddies. So they just uh, look for wallets and they run the script to get uh, the money out. So, and this is kind of the main danger for us because, uh, well, there are plenty of these guys and there are much less people that actually run the lightning nodes or know how the lightning works and so on. So even by moving these keys to the air gap, uh, to the cold storage, we can slightly improve our security. Um, and the interesting thing is all these keys are defined at the moment when we open the channel. Uh, so the thing is that, uh, for example, this mutual close key, uh, when you're opening the channel, you have an ability to say to the other node, you know, I'm opening the channel with you, and we, when I will ask you to mutually close the channel, please make sure that I'm sending my money to this particular address. So even after, uh, so when we open the channel, and even uh, if our node is hacked, the attacker cannot mutually close the channel uh, to his address. So basically, if the other node behaves correctly, then the only way to close the channel is to close it to our cold storage. Uh, the same here as all these keys, uh, the channel keys, uh, are derived from the uh, base point, from the uh, initial key that we define in the very beginning when we open the channel. Also, uh, the attacker cannot update the channel and insert his keys there. So uh, this means that if we move this stuff to the air gap, uh, to the cold storage, then we can be sure that the only way for the attacker to sweep our funds is by lightning payments. Unfortunately, it is still possible, so basically you can still lose all the funds uh, on your lightning node, but for this the attacker has to have the node and they have to maintain the infrastructure, they have to be sure that they have an, uh, enough incoming capacity and basically this means that it is already not a normal script kiddie that got into your Ubuntu and sweeped the funds, but it is actually the guy who, is, uh, who knows what he is doing. So uh, slightly smaller attack surface, so it is harder for the attacker. Uh, then to get there, what can we do right now? I mean we have hardware wallets, uh, they kind of work, uh, and they uh, can store the private keys, right? Uh, so what can we do right now in the Lightning implementation? As far as I know, none of the Lightning implementations support 
any kind of hardware support. Uh, so what we can do right now, we can uh, move at least some of the keys to the hardware wallet. So it would be very nice to see uh, the Lightning implementation that can fund the channel by using the uh, keys from the hardware wallet, uh, or that can enforce closing the channel to the hardware wallet. So that would be already a pretty good improvement. At least uh, when your channels are randomly closed, you are not putting them on your online machine, it goes actually to the hardware wallet. And uh, you don't really need to implement this integration for every hardware wallet separately. Right now we have a very nice tool, uh, HWI, I think it is uh, hardware wallet interface or something like that, uh, that basically works as a universal translator between a partially signed Bitcoin transaction format that is uh, defined in the BIP uh, to the vendor specific communication to the, all the hardware wallets. So this means that if a certain lightning implementation um, it supports of uh, external storage for at least these keys and integrates the HWI, then we will have any hardware wallet supporting that. So that would be nice. Uh, and I think that it is not super uh, hard to implement. So I was thinking about doing it as a hackathon project, but then I realized that there are too many changes in different Lightning implementations to do. So uh, screw that, maybe a little bit later, uh, or at least focusing on one of them. Um, yeah, so this is the first one. Uh, then the problem here is that uh, these keys that we had in blue on the previous slide, they are derived not like a normal Bitcoin key. So for normal Bitcoin keys, we use uh, BIP32 and this uh, key derivation scheme. So these guys are derived slightly differently. So uh, we do need certain changes in the hardware wallet to support another derivation scheme. Uh, but it's really minor. So it is even easier than uh, doing BIP32. So it uh, should be doable. Uh, then uh, let's say we moved all these keys to the uh, hardware wallet. Let's imagine that we have a hardware wallet that can uh, put all the keys there. So we can kind of have the hardware wallet that is connected to the node, uh, and all the signing happens only on the hardware wallet, uh, and uh, yeah, hardware wallet can verify something. Uh, so uh, what is the attack surface in this case? Uh, first, yeah, a few things. What do we require from the hardware wallet to kind of make it reasonable or reasonably work with the Lightning node. Uh, first, we probably don't want to uh, confirm every signature on the screen, right? Because we have all these routing hopes, we have uh, other parties that are opening channel with us. So basically, for this, you would need to buy, a, well, to hire a guy who will constantly sit in front of your hardware wallet and press the button. So it's kind of stupid. So what we can do instead, we can uh, add, um, certain automatic functionality into the hardware wallet. For example, if the other party is uh, other node uh, is opening channel to us, we don't lose any funds. They just take their money, they take care of the fees, they just offer us uh, like a channel for free, right? So uh, why shouldn't we sign this? Well, so it would be nice to sign this automatically if our hardware wallet is connected and if we can verify that the user funds are safe, that they are not trying to steal anything from us, basically just ver verifying uh, two transactions together, we can do it. The same with the routing payments. Uh, so you have an HTLC offer coming from somewhere, you offer the same uh, slightly less amount to another party, so you have kind of transactions in pairs where your balance either doesn't change at all if you use zero fees uh, or it slightly increases like I don't know one satoshi or what are normal routing fees right now in the network so also should be doable um, automatically and also closing the channel closing the channel is great I mean that it's normally uh, means that uh, we can just sign and get our money back on chain um, the the problem here is that it is not enough. So uh, if we are thinking about the hardware wallets, this means that we are probably thinking that our node is compromised. And this means, ah yeah, this is how it works. So uh, no, not this one, the red ones, yeah. So our node is compromised. Uh, and also the attacker, not a script kitty, but some more uh, sophisticated guy uh, that has certain infrastructure. So he has another node somewhere. 
Uh, so if we only uh, verify the transactions without anything else, uh, that's what he can do if he controls our node. He can say, he can tell us that, okay, there is a channel between these two nodes, uh, but in reality this channel never exists, so he just claims that there is a channel. And yeah, uh, he tries to make a, route, uh, a circle route, so basically using this virtual non-existing channel, uh, he can transfer the funds to himself uh, by pushing, well, this amount to our nodes. Uh, so basically this means that if the channel, if we cannot verify that the channel was open on chain, then we can, can't be uh, really secure. So this adds another constraint on the hardware wallet. We need not only to verify the transactions like in pairs or like uh, that there is a commitment transaction, we also need to watch the blockchain. So we do need to verify that the channel was open. So we basically need to stream all the box to the hardware wallet, uh, or at least the proof that a certain transaction was included in the block. Uh, and then we know that, yeah, the channel exists. What uh, is the closing? Huh? It might, it, it might, okay, it might have been open, but it might have been closed since. Yes, so that's the next one. So this is not enough. Just parsing the, uh, so we, we need to then to parse the whole uh, blockchain all the time and see that the channel is also not closed. So uh, the only way for the other party to uh, close the channel such that our uh, hardware wallet doesn't notice this uh, is by broadcasting the um, unilateral close. So uh, there will be a transaction that we will find that has a time lock and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so uh, the problem is that we then need to parse the whole blockchain and we need to make sure that this blockchain is not delayed. This, because uh, imagine if this node just, if the attacker opens the channel, then uh, he starts delaying the blocks a bit by a bit by a bit. So like uh, basically after a few, well, after some time, we have a delay between the blocks that are coming to the hardware wallet, uh, like seven days or what is the uh, current uh, closing time, uh, probably something like that. Uh, so yeah, if we don't know the current time, there is also a problem. So yeah, delaying the blocks and then closing the channel and then again the same problem. So we also need to add a real-time clock. So this means that we need to uh, keep track of the time and this is the main uh, kind of struggles with the lightning because lightning is very time sensitive. Uh, so yeah, also real-time clock should be in the hardware. So it is already getting a little bit more complicated. Uh, and uh, another problem is if the other party misbehaves and he broadcasts the old state, like the very first state, uh, or like the most uh, profitable state for, for the other party, and our node is compromised, and our node is just blocking, uh, so not behaving correctly, and just blocking the hardware wallet from uh, pushing this uh, penalty transaction on chain. Uh, then this means that we need another communication channel, really. So, yeah. Uh, so this means that either our hardware wallet itself should have another channel to, uh, I don't know, either with radio or uh, somehow to communicate to the watchtower, uh, or we can also route it through the node and just ask uh, for the confirmation that it was accepted by the watchtower. Uh, but if it goes through, the, uh, through this node, then probably the node also knows uh, what else to hack. So ideally it should be a completely independent channel and ideally unidirectional. The problem is that then the security uh, is a little a bit worse because your hardware wallet have additional communication channel and you know what happens in this. Uh, so can you explain this, this again? So if there is an independent watchtower, why do you need to have the hardware wallet know that the watchtower needs to react or anything? Like uh, so how does the watchtower, uh, how can we verify that the watchtower knows about our latest channel updates? So if our node is compromised, uh, our node may just not uh, send this information to the watchtower or send some arbitrary information. So what we need instead, either we ask the node to send this information to the watchtower and then get a confirmation from the watchtower that it received it, uh, or we have our own uh, backup communication channel. Uh, the only, uh, well, what could work probably uh, is 
The time locks are pretty large right now. So we have like uh, seven days to react to the um, to broadcast the penalty transaction. So basically, we can use the screen of the uh, hardware wallet itself to notify the user. You just need to come by and uh, look at it every seven days or so. Uh, it is not a problem for like normal users like we are, uh, but it may be a problem for like merchants or like liquidity providers or people that are storing this stuff in the data center. So you don't want to mess with the data center. Uh, so yeah, for this, I don't have a perfect solution yet, but would be nice to have something like that. Uh, so in total, ah, yeah, and another thing. Uh, Normally, hardware wallets are stateless. So ideally, what you want from a normal hardware wallet, you just remove it, uh, you wipe it, you connect it back, you, you know, basically reset by entering your mnemonic, and it is again functioning and working. Uh, so the problem in the Lightning is that it is not stateless. It needs to maintain the state. So we need a database of channels. We need, uh, in order to derive the keys, to, in order to derive the, uh, this, to store the uh, revocation keys and all this stuff. So this means that either we can store this information on the node, but then what if the node is compromised and he deletes this database? Uh, or we need some kind of internal storage uh, where we store this database. So it looks like half of the Lightning node is actually moving to the hardware wallet in this case. Uh, so it is a little bit challenging, but still, uh, still feasible. So still we can uh, manage to do something in that sense. And plus, yeah, with the Lightning, you can't be perfectly secure because even if you think that your node is perfectly secure, then still, uh, if someone is trying to DOS you and you still don't have a watchtower or watchtower are not reliable, then still you can uh, lose your funds. Uh, so with the hardware wallet, what we can do, we can't make it perfectly secure, but we can it more secure than it is right now. Uh, so in that sense, ah, yeah. And another thing, uh, there are additional requirements on the hardware wallet uh, that we have to face when we do this automatic signing. Uh, basically, uh, how they normally work right now. As soon as you enter the pin, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but here what we need, we need to lock it uh, again and to do certain automatic signing while, while it is locked. And this means that all the secrets are probably in the memory. So this is first uh, kind of additional attack surface. Uh, and second, uh, the attacker, if he gets access to your hardware like directly, then he can use all kinds of side channels and other analysis tools uh, to analyze how you sign stuff. So basically your lightning node is operating, you're routing the payments all the time, uh, and the attacker just uh, sits there with the oscilloscope and measures the traces and derives the secrets from that. Uh, so it is especially uh, hard to mitigate for uh, microcontroller based, well, like um, general purpose microcontroller based uh, hardware wallets like Trezor and Coldcard that do uh, the hardware, uh, the cryptography on the mm, normal chip. Uh, so there you can have a bunch of side channels and I know that Trezor have one that is, was not an issue before uh, because in order to use this side channel you need to first enter the pin and if you enter the pin you can have full access. For Lightning it is a little bit different so we need to fix uh, this kind of attacks. Uh, and for the uh, wallets that are based on secure elements like Ledger and uh, similar, there is also a problem because the secure elements are not super powerful. And in this case, to make everything reasonably secure, all this stuff, like all these blocks and transactions, they all have to go to the secure element. And the secure element well, will have a pretty hard time. And especially if you put the node ID as well in there, then all the communication goes through the secure element, and then it, is, it will be overwhelmed. Uh, but still, it looks like there are ways to get to a reasonably secure point um, well, at least to start moving to that direction. And then as soon as we have more powerful and more capable hardware wallets, we will uh, get better and better. And at the end, uh, ideally, we should have it uh, as a hardware secure module. Uh, so that's roughly it about the secrets. If you have any questions, I don't know how much time did I spend, probably less than half an hour. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Yeah?
I didn't quite understand what kind of Bitcoin verification on the hardware device you would suggest. Uh, you mean blockchain verification? Yes. Uh, so what we need here, um, basically, we need to parse the header and to verify that the difficulty is correct, that uh, it still maintains. SPV uh, mostly SPV verification, but not quite, as we need to check that tran all transactions are not the ones that we are watching. So uh, if we would have a proof of uh, both like proof of inclusion and proof of not in like exclusion in the block, that would help a lot, because then you can just provide these proofs and then hardware wallet doesn't need to parse all the blocks. Unfortunately, right now we need to uh, make sure that uh, certain transactions are not in the block. And this means that we need to go through all transactions and at least uh, check the uh, previous uh, transaction ID uh, on the inputs uh, of all the transactions. Uh, you take so in existence? Yeah, you care about the channel outpoint being open? Ah, and being unspent, yes, yeah. being unspent. So yeah, I need some kind of proof that the channel is uh, still unspent. So if we do, uh, I think that there was a suggestion to put uh, Bloom filters into the uh, block, uh, like a root of the Bloom filters into the, uh, into the block, that would help. Uh, be because then, yeah, these filters can't be malformed by, by the node. Uh, and yeah, verifying the uh, difficulty uh, of the block, we can make sure that uh, yeah, there are enough zeros in the beginning, so it is a real block, it's good enough. And also the nice thing is that the blocks have timestamp. And this means that, uh, and this timestamp, it is not perfectly precise. It is uh, varying in plus minus two hours. By the cons but by the consensus, you have this plus minus two hours kind of discrepancy, but still it's, it's the time. So if you have your own real time clock in the machine and you have the block, you can verify that, yeah, this block was not delayed by more than two hours. Yeah. Okay, so you would have a hard cutoff after two hours, if there's no block after two hours, you would shut down. Uh, well, basically, uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, so if you don't see the blocks for a certain time, then you probably should notify the user that something is wrong. And if you see the blocks that are delayed by more than two hours, then you should also stop functioning or, or notify the user, yeah. So you only need the real time clock because uh, because of the variety of time that you're using? Uh, well, if you're using CSV, then you wouldn't need the real-time clock. Uh, so you do need to, uh, the real-time clock because you need to verify that the uh, blocks that are coming to you are actually aligned with the real-time. Because imagine if you unplug your hardware wallet and plug it back two days later, and then you start sending it the blocks that were uh, two days uh, in the past. Uh, without real-time clock, uh, it can't really verify that. So the concern is that they're sending you blocks that aren't actually on the blockchain? Uh, well, no, you are sending the blocks that are far in the past. So you are delaying the blocks. So what, what you really want, uh, what the attacker wants to do, uh, he wants to fool the hardware wallet that the channel uh, is still open. And uh, when the channel is open, the channel is uh, open if there were not no uh, closing transaction, like unilateral closed transaction uh, for these seven days or, or certain time. Uh, so uh, this means that if we would be able to trick the hardware wallet that we are currently working far in the past, then it would think that the uh, channel is still open. Uh, not very clear, but yeah, we, we can chat afterwards about that. Okay, uh, do I have time? Nope. Okay, so quickly. Um, I said quickly, not like one second per animation. Yeah, uh, this is what I announced uh, during the uh, during this uh, initial kind of preparation thing. This is what we are uh, building today and tomorrow. Uh, this is a bidirectional for NTM where uh, it, it's kind of uh, I have this chocolate uh, euros. Uh, and they have a microcontroller in the server and the QR code scanner and that we will put all together and make an offline machine uh, that can uh, accept payments uh, in Lightning. By offline, I mean offline. Uh, 
uh, because what you really have is you have an online node somewhere in the cloud uh, and you have uh, this offline thing that can generate invoices. Uh, so the thing here is that this thing generates invoices, you uh, pay the invoice to the, to the node in the cloud, that node gives you the pre-image, you show this pre-image to the machine, the machine verifies and gives you the chocolate fiat money. And the other direction it works as well, but uh, yeah, if we will be able to do it, then we will present it uh, on the Barcom session probably tomorrow. Yeah, thanks a lot guys. <laughs>